for me, it's just pretty obvious that what people are searching for is inside. I think we're sold that it's outside of us. Mm-hmm. And, we, and people in this world do a pretty good job of selling you, selling that's outside of you. And you need to go get more to get it. Yeah. You know, if you look at like a, uh, a Twitter or, mm-hmm. you know, Instagram or these things or like, or like on Facebook, when people are getting likes mm-hmm. or all these things, my understanding is that doesn't satisfy anything deep down. It's almost like a dope fiend or it's, yep. it's, tr- it's triggering uh, response that you're, you're an addict and, mm-hmm. and you're never going to solve anything. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Graham, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. It is awesome to be here. I'm excited. (laughs) Well, it is my pleasure to have you here. You know, I actually came across your story by way of our mutual friend, Tony Stubblebine, who was recently a guest here on The Unmistakable Creative, uh, who talked about decoding human performance. And after we finished, I asked him if he had anybody in mind who he thought would make uh, for an interesting guest. And he mentioned that you were a mental toughness coach for professional athletes. So naturally, I was incredibly intrigued. Uh, But before we we get into your work, um, I want to ask you, what you think one of the most important lessons you learned growing up was from either a mentor, a parent, or a teacher that has influenced and shaped the work that you do and the life that you've ended up living? Wow. Okay. Um, I, you know, I, my life has been, um, for whatever reason, I'm around extremely powerful women. And that's, that was kind of my upbringing. Uh, I was delivered by midwives on a hippie commune in Tennessee called The Farm. And for those of you that <laughs> are into midwives, I was delivered by Ina Mae Gaskin, who is the uh, Michael Jordan of midwives. She wrote Spiritual Midwifery and uh, has delivered thousands of babies. And so my, my early experience in life was growing up on a commune and then being raised by my mom, a single mom who had me when she was 20, and she became a midwife. And so by eight, nine years old, I knew more about uh, like dilation and, and, and childbirth than most people I've ever met in my life. So my, my experience of like, you know, where did I get like a profound lesson from or like, um, I, you know, it would really come from my mom at a very young age. I would consider my mom to be very, uh, she's extremely competitive and she's competitive at being authentically who you are. So I was raised with, if I didn't follow my passion, if I didn't follow something that had meaning for me, I was going to be like outcasted from the family. So I had, so coming up for me, what was normal for me seemed very abnormal for everyone else. So I had a mom who let me know that um, your your mind, your brain can be rewired. You can you can work through depression. You can you can do all these things with the power of your mind. And so I was introduced to a healer when I was 19 years old by my mom when I was going through some severe depression and ended up doing a lot of work on myself for about three years in the mid 90s. So I'm trying to answer your question. I would almost say it's like three peoples, Mm -hmm. the midwife who delivered me, Ina Mae Gaskin, my mom, um, Kathy Gordon, and then my 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 mental teacher, who is Jocelyn Nielsen, who runs the San Francisco Healing Center, I would say those three women opened my eyes to what was actually possible in this human experience. And um, from from that, I, I took it and ran, you know, and I've just been on that my entire life, you know, so I've, I feel very fortunate that whatever reason, um, I was around those three people and they helped me become aware of, of, of all this stuff that I'm trying to teach now through sports. I learned this stuff through what I would be considered some weird hippie stuff, you know, some weird hippies who moved from the Bay Area in the in the sixties to form a commune in Tennessee. Like to me, that's normal. That's not weird. I'm, that's <laughs> that's totally normal to have your, you know, my wife and I have two babies and they were both delivered by midwives, natural childbirth, no drugs. And and for me that's totally normal. And my wife trained for nine months with mindfulness training to go towards the pain uh-huh. of childbirth and not to go away from it. So I that's kind of how I was raised is you go towards 
your pain. Uh, you don't run away from your stuff. You heal. You become whole. And that's where all your power is. And so I was taught that by very powerful women. And uh, I kind of took that with my own life. And then my calling, it, it seems to be, if I listen closely to the voice inside of me, is to take all this stuff and deliver it to a population that really needs it. And so a lot of my work has been giving this to males in really competitive environments. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like at a very young age, you know, at 19 and, you know, 1997, I was um, working heavily on self-help, um, developing myself, working, going through pain and all kinds of trauma. And I didn't have anyone to talk to at that time or any other, you know, boys to relate to. So I just kind of kept it all to myself. But I knew I had some power. I knew I had I had figured some stuff out. I had been taught some stuff. Um, and then fast forward four or five years later when I'm finishing college, you know, that's when I meet a Donald Foyle who says the words to me, hey, man, have you ever heard of sports psychology? And I thought to myself, wow, is that the, the sports entryway into the stuff I was training on five or six years ago, but was hooey and weird. But now I hear these words sports psychology. So I felt like here's a way for me to get the training that I was trained on when I was young, which was essentially being whole, healing, you know, um, those type of things. Can I get this now to a population through sports? You know, and it just clicked. I said, hey, man, if someone can get this through sports, um, I can do it. I, and so I felt like I had a purpose in life is to get mental health or healing, mental training to people. And sports was the medium that, in my opinion, people think sports is kind of cool and they, you know, they look up to athletes sometimes. So I thought here's this perfect scenario where I can go in and train athletes with this stuff through the guise of sports psychology um, and hopefully blow this up because what I did should be normal. It shouldn't, I shouldn't have got lucky and had Ina May deliver me and my mother introduced me to Jocelyn. And so I start doing all this work. You know, my experience is people were not introduced to this. So for whatever reason, man, I, I was introduced to it and I took it and ran with it and it, it, it opened my life up to me and showed me what real confidence was. And so I feel like my mission in life is to kind of share what I was lucky enough to be introduced to, you know? So, so these three women, when you look at it now, I mean, when, when I asked you the question, you mentioned them specifically, but at the time when they arrived in your life, each one of them, uh, do you only recognize their significance in retrospect or is it something you realized at the time? No, it's all in retrospect. You know, I, I had no idea, you know, no, no. I, again, I thought this was all normal. Mm -hmm. I thought everything I was doing normal. Then you go through life and you're like, no one's had these experiences. You say you're going to have your child at home. People think you're going to kill your baby, you know, and you're like, whoa, you know, like, so it, it was only later on in life that I realized that I got some good stuff that, you know, and I was young. I grew up going to public school here in San Francisco. I mean, that's where I met Tony Stubblebine. We went to public school together in the city here and we went to middle school together. So it wasn't like that's cool on the playgrounds, you know, this self-help and healing work. So it wasn't until much later in life, mm -hmm. uh, really, really in my early twenties that I started to figure out that, Hey man, this, this is something, you know, as I started to see people fall apart or kind of fall out in life, I realized I was very stable and I had a real grounded in me. And I had done a lot of work to get that. And I just, I could just see that the world needed that, you know? And so it wasn't until much later that I, that I even had any idea that what I was doing was in any way, maybe different than other people or what all, um, was really helping me out. I had no idea, you know, what misperceptions do you think somebody, uh, from the outside might have, uh, about life growing up in what, what appears to be a hippie commune? Because like, I literally think burning man and smoking joints and, you know, just shit that my parents would think you've lost your mind if I told them yeah. I was going to go down that road. Um, and again, yeah. I, I realize I'm saying that having absolutely no direct experience with it other than maybe what I've seen in media. Yeah. You know what? I, and this is what I tell everyone. I would just, just like you, I would say, Hey, what comes up for you when I even say that word? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like when I say the word hippie, people, you can say, I could say 12 different words for you and a whole bunch of stories will, you know, will come up for you. So what I use the opportunities to help people kind of see, um, maybe some of the stuff they have in them, you know, cause my experience with, you know, like hippies quote unquote is awesome. You know, my experience with living on a commune, I mean, it was only it was super young, but it was like everyone helping each other, everyone like sharing everyone working together. And then you grow up and in the 80s and you hear about communism in Russia and you're like, this is the worst thing in the world. And so you kind of, you know, it, 
it's, it was, it was a challenging thing. My parents were also deadheads, you know, so I was going to Grateful Dead shows when I was three years old and I was kind of in this environment. Um, and so the stigma is that, you know, they're like just like a dirty hippie who doesn't have their shit together. You know, it's just kind of all over the place, and um, you know, it's just doing drugs and tripping out. And mm-hmm. while there is a lot of that there, I've always felt like my role was to help people kind of break that because that's what I come from. I also went to UC Santa Cruz for for my undergrad, which can bring up a lot for people as well when I say, you know, UC Santa Cruz. And um, so I, I I've considered my whole life to be kind of like this dichotomy of holding two opposite ends of the spectrum together like yes here is this whole hippie environment where you come from where they're open-minded and they're free spirit and 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 they're kind of doing all these things like that and then i tried to take that into this super competitive world which is all controlling and force and like you know hippies are soft and what i do is i bring in compassion and empathy from the hippies into sports world and what the athletes realize is man that shit helps you win and that if you actually study what Michael Jordan did, or if you look at what the Warriors are doing right now, they're practicing mindfulness and compassion. Um, you know, and so I always knew, and this is why I consider myself an entrepreneur, man, I got something. I know what these hippies were practicing works. It just hasn't been done in the way where either people took it seriously or the West could kind of kind of respect it. And I always came from a model of, look, man, I played competitive sports in high school. I played in college. I've coached, um, trained the last three number one draft picks. So whatever you think about hippies, you're looking at it. Like Mm -hmm. you're looking at, I've, you know, um, so I always try, it's just a contrast. Like I, I consider my life this kind of contrast and I consider myself someone who's trying to help. Um, I'm like a translator. I help people translate through their, their either prejudices or biases about, what mental training is or, you know, like hippies are. And I try to help them see, maybe see it from a little different perspective, you know, and try to help them kind of like, I'm not a shrink, I'm a stretch. I try to help people open their mind and see, see all the vast capabilities, you know, we all have, you know, which was tough though. Cause you know, I, growing up in San Francisco and, um, you know, playing basketball uh, at the parks and stuff, you know, like it wasn't like wearing a tie dye was respected or like if I wore a tie dye, I was going to get picked first. I'd get picked last. And so a lot of times I'd wear a tie dye to the park on purpose, knowing I was the best basketball player, mm-hmm. but people would pick me last and I would kick their ass <laughs> you know, just to help them realize, Hey, your own unconscious bias just caused you to lose. And if you'd have been aware of that, you'd have realized that I was the best player here, but you, you saw a tie dye and then that blocked everything in you. So I, I kind of enjoy that. I'm kind of a thorn for people. You know, I kind of, um, you know, I, so it's, it's like this, I'm kind of like a walking contrast. That's kind of how I see myself. You know, it's like, Hey, I'm going to bring almost like these deep Eastern philosophies. I feel like I'm kind of helping and bringing them to the West in a, and the West can only take things in like a competitive kind of tough way, you know? So I try to deliver it in ways that, you know, people can take it in. Cause usually they just write it off. They're like, ah, oh, that's soft. Compassion is soft. And if I said, Hey man, that was the most important thing that Kobe Bryant learned. Mm-hmm. And he wished he learned that at 18. You tell me if that's soft. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like Kobe Bryant is considered the most competitive person. And he wished he had understood compassion when he was 18. He would have won far more. Would have won. A, but that word doesn't, people don't equate that with success in, you know, like ice water in your veins or competitive. But I, I can blend both of those. Compassion and competitiveness um, in that same breath, you know. So it's, I don't know if that makes any sense, oh, yeah. man. But that's, you know, uh, I'm always walking around with this tension of two things, you know, this like tense, tense tension, you know, um, but that's me, you know, that's, I kind of, I can, I can encompass, encompass them both, you know? Yeah. What's been the impact on your life? Um, and on, uh, the work that you do with people of having no father figure. I don't know. You know, I, I'm not exactly sure how I could know, um, you know, the impact I'm having on people's lives with no father figure. I know, you know, I used to teach at mission high school in San Francisco and I've worked with a ton of kids that come from, you know, broken homes or that aren't there. And I sometimes feel like I've built this app to talk to my own self when I was like 14 years old, Mm -hmm. you know, to like, to be that voice I needed to hear that was telling me, Hey, I'm okay. It's okay. If you fail, it's okay. If you make mistakes, you know, keep, keep coming. And I was so critical and so hard on myself um, so I, I try to provide a voice for people, you know, to maybe help 
kind of guide them and, and, and put them on that path. But, you know, my, my father and I are, you know, we're close now, but you know, my parents got divorced when I was really young. So my experience was just, you know, just being raised by my mom. And so I've always felt like that kind of, you know, I want to help people, you know, I, um, I want to give people a voice. And so I, I don't know, you know, that's, that's, that's a deep question. You know, I, I, I don't know, you know, I know it's not seeking outside of myself and looking inside is where I found all my power. And so the women that taught me were instead of like, Hey, go seek for some figure to help you out. You already have it inside of you. So I'm always trying to empower people that you have it inside of you, no matter what situation you're in, whether you're in foster care, you have two parents or whatever's going on in your life, you have it in you anyway. And even if you have parents, you still have to do the work yourself anyway. Your parents can't do it for you. So I, that's how I was taught. It's like, it doesn't matter your situation. You are empowered inside you. And to me, that's mental training is learning how to unlock your full brilliance. And you have to do that work. There's no one else who can do that work for you. And so if there's anything I do to help people, it's let them know that you have the power already in you and you have the power to release that and to be as powerful as you can. You don't need anybody else for that, but you do need yourself, you know? So anyway, I don't know. You know, um, I, I, we'll do a, I definitely do a deep dive into, into the actual work that you do. Um, one of the things that really struck me about what you just said is you said, you know, we, you were taught to look for answers within yourself. And it seems like it's deeply informed so much of what you do. And yet I look at culture, especially Western culture. And it seems like what we do constantly is that we seek, uh, answers outside of ourselves. Like we seek satisfaction outside of ourselves. Mm. We need external validation we need reassurance, like all these things that we think are going to heal these like holes in our hearts and wondering why you think that that narrative is so dominant in Western culture? I think it's just easy to grasp. It's easy to see. Hmm. You could say, hey, if I go out and do this, I make this money. Yeah. And then I go, I buy this house and this person says, great job. And so it's really just easy. And it, it to me, the inner work of looking in and trying to find that voice inside of you and finding that validation inside, to me, that's much harder. Mm-hmm. It's just, it just takes more work. And so I I feel like humans are always trying to find the easiest thing they can do, and they're trying to be as comfortable as they can. If you look at Western world, like ultimately, are we just going to be sitting on a couch, never moving our body, but living in virtual reality? Like, is that is that where this is going, where we don't have to physically ever feel uncomfortable, but we can do everything? And I would say a lot of my own spiritual awareness came from being uncomfortable and came from situations where I had to you know, sift through some uncomfortable stuff or think about thoughts and feelings and be with that stuff. So I feel like for me, I got taught to look for the validation within when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I always found the most power is finding that validation inside. Now, again, I got lucky, right? I was introduced to these people who taught me that who were like, hey, look, this is real power. You can go try to buy a $5 million house and go get that job and see if that does anything to you. And this is, you know, when I work with basketball players who get drafted and they sign a $12 million deal and six months later, they're like, that didn't do shit for me, Graham. I'm like, well, there you go. Now you realize that that doesn't mean anything. Pieces of green paper aren't going to do anything for you, for you. And some of the biggest thing I, I pass down to athletes is I look for no external validation, none. None whatsoever. I, I need none of that. Mm-hmm. And all the validation for me are, for lack of better words, are pings inside of me that resonate and let me know I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And it's, uh, they're emotions I can't even describe sometimes, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm so grounded in that. And I also know that like an external thing is very fleeting and it's, it's not really lasting. And so I think in the West it's easy and I think marketers sell that. And I think marketers are very crafty on how they sell stuff. Mm -hmm. So they're always selling that, hey, you don't have enough, you need more to be okay. You don't have enough, you need more to be okay. What I'm selling is you already have everything in you. Everything is already inside of you that you need. You need nothing to come in. We might need to take some layers off of you though to get to your source. That's that's and so me the validation is in. You can keep building outside, but I've never found anyone that's actually satisfied with that. And I know you know, I've been, you know, I know a couple of billionaires at this point who have doing, done well in tech and you see them still searching, mm-hmm. you know, so a billion dollars didn't solve it. It should let you know that what you're searching for is not outside. 
Yeah. And so I, th- I think in this world, what we're searching for is inside, but in the West, we sell it that it's outside. And so you're in this rat race of like, you're never going to satisfy what you're looking for. If you make a billion dollars, then you're going to be like, I need $10 billion. Mm-hmm. And then you get $10 billion. You're like, I need a trillion. You'd be like, this never stops, you know? And so Adonel helped me out with this a lot when I was first getting in as well. When he was first, he got traded from the warriors to the magic. And when he was on the magic, um, you know, Donald had signed a $40 million deal and he's like, I'm doing great. And then he meets the grandchild of the owner of the magic and he has like six private planes and it's all just a joke to him. And immediately Donald felt really bad. And what he realized was, Hey man, there's always going to be someone with more money or something bigger than you. So that, that cannot be how we base what this is all about. That can't be it, you know? And so I, for me, it's just pretty obvious that what people are searching for is inside. I think we're sold that it's outside of us. Mm-hmm. And, we, and people in this world do a pretty good job of selling, you, selling that's outside of you, and you need to go get more to get it. Yeah. You know, if you look at like a, uh, a Twitter or, mm-hmm. you know, Instagram or these things or like, or like on Facebook, when people are getting likes mm-hmm. or all these things, my understanding is that doesn't satisfy anything deep down. It's almost like a dope fiend or it's, yep. it's, tr- it's triggering a uh, response that you're, you're an addict and, mm-hmm. and you're never going to solve anything. And yet these people are making billions of dollars. And I'm like, what are we selling people? Like, what are, what are we actually creating here? You know, so that's human behavior. Like humans are, that's how humans, you know, that's how they do it. So what we're trying to do is, is, is help people, you know, find that validation inside, yeah. you know, and, and make it cool. Mm-hmm. That's been that's been the thing that's always been missing. The people who are telling you the validation is inside. The Westerners are like, "Who's this person? This is some hippie. <laughs> this is some hippie from a farm in Tennessee." I'm not listening to them. Yeah. This guy doesn't get it. I want to listen to someone who's got a billion dollars tell me the validation is still within, though. Uh-huh. You know, even if I have a billion dollars, that doesn't mean shit. Yeah. The, what means that's just a result of me having faith inside and me already being validated. You know, so. It's really interesting. You brought Facebook of all things and you, you literally pointed out that there's actual scientific research that has been done around this. Simon Sinek in his, his latest book talked extensively about how um, Facebook likes give us an incredibly artificial sense of satisfaction because they're create, you know, they, they cause dopamine surges. But what he said yeah. that's really insidious is that it's incredibly addictive and the satisfaction doesn't last. And it's completely <laughs> made up and manufactured is the even crazier part. Yeah, right. So you're like, man, and, and everyone's on this. And, yeah. you know, my the first book I wrote was called Play Present. Mm-hmm. And the whole idea was is be where you are. Like if you look down and saw your feet right now on the floor, I would say you got to be where your feet are. And if you're not where your feet are, where are you? Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I see people all over the world. Um, they're not where they are. You know, they're on their phone and, and they're someplace else. You know, so I, I see this. We're always someplace else looking for something. Like you see people seeking all the time. They're seeking on Facebook. They're seeking on Twitter, Snap, whatever it is. They're seeking something. And even if you have uh, a million followers, I bet I doubt you have one follower. You know what I mean? Like I doubt you have one person you can call up at 3 a.m. and be like, I need your help. You know, like we. So it's like, yeah, you might have a million people following you, but like you said, this this is triggering um, addict type behavior. And I I just. I think we got to get deeper, man. You know, yeah. I think we got to find a way to, to actually re- – because I think people are actually seeking help. Mm-hmm. That They're just seeking help the way they know how they, and they don't know any different. And they're just in this rat race of feelings and following feelings and thinking feelings are reality. And, and there we are. You know, then all of a sudden you're trying to get likes and you're like, nothing is happening in my life. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> no, no, no relationship has any depth at all now. Like there, where's the depth? You know, yeah. like where's – so I think people are still seeking – you said earlier that um, you know early uh, earlier on in your life, like around nineteen or so, you hit a point of really, really deep depression. And yeah. um, I'm very curious as to you know what led you there, and more importantly, what got you out of it. Yeah, no, I love sharing um, you know my stories, and you know when I was, it was I was nineteen years old. It was my first year of college. It was nineteen ninety seven in the spring, and I was going. I was at Cabrillo Junior College in Santa Cruz, and uh, I played basketball for the team. I walked on and played for the JC, um, and it was like this culmination of in like a two week span, everything that I thought I was fell apart and died. 
Everything. So I essentially, the first time I ever severely sprained my ankle. And if anyone has ever experienced that for the first time, it's shocking when you sprain your ankle severely the first time. And so I had a severely sprained ankle. You know, my girlfriend at the time who I'd been with for years left me. My mother and I um, had a falling out and she kicked all the stuff out of my room. So I had no house at home. Um, So all I had no home. Everything that was holding me up of who I thought I was, was falling apart. And behind that, I had all these stories that I had been trying to stay one step ahead of. Um, And my stories were that I was a terrible person. I was a person that hurt other people. I didn't understand boundaries. Um, You know, when I was younger, I had hurt other people through selfish acts and not being aware. And I just had felt so much guilt and so much shame and depression for kind of how I was acting when I was young. And then, you know, when I broke my foot, my mom kind of left me and my girlfriend left me and I was in Santa Cruz kind of wondering like who I was. I remember thinking, and it, it all, all this pain came rushing up that I could no longer run away from. Like I could no longer keep all the pain that I had inside of me down through basketball and through like positive energy. It was like, no, here it comes. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, I'm either going to die or I'm going to live. And this is the moment. And it was so crystal clear to me that I had a choice to make, that I was like, there's no way could I carry this weight, you know? And it was in that moment that I let go. And I, yeah, you might say the word gave up. I don't know what it was, but I remember thinking like, I can't carry this anymore. This can't be life. You know, I can't carry these burdens and, and feel this weight on my back. And this is, and there was pay phones at the time. It was 97, you know, so I went to a pay phone and I said, I'm going to call my mom. And I called my mom and, and I told her, I was like, mom, I can't go on. Like, I can't live life anymore. I can't do this anymore. This stuff is just way too heavy. You know, I can't do it. And she, I remember clear as day, she got real quiet and my mom was like, it's okay. Did, did you know that you can rewire your brain? And I thought to myself, I have no fucking idea what you just said, but it sounded like an option besides death. So I'm going with it. You know, I was like, cool, whatever that means. I had already given, I didn't care. I'd given up. I don't care. I give up. Yeah. And I was like, cool. She said, okay, I'm going to go introduce you to this woman named Jocelyn who runs the San Francisco Healing Center. And I was like, cool. Didn't, I didn't care. And I went and, you know, went and saw Jocelyn uh, in the spring of 1997. And, you know, first thing she said was close your eyes. And we started working on meditation and bringing all of me back together that had fallen apart. And we were doing affirmations and all this real deep um, inner work, you know, to rebuild my self-esteem, to love myself wholly, you know, to do all that. And uh, I'll be damned, you know, a couple years later, uh, I had the joy back in my life. And I was like, holy shit, you know, here I am. I thought for sure I was going to die. I thought for sure I was a terrible person in life. And, you know, that was that. And it turned out none of that was true. You know, and so those were some of the illusions and stories that I had to work through. And so my awareness, you know, opened up through that. But the, the, the key to me was I let go and I asked for help. Mm-hmm. And my understanding is as soon as you let go and your intentions are to heal, it starts right away. Right? The healing starts right away, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So that and I took that and stopped playing basketball. <laughs> Right. But then all all of a sudden I did this healing for a couple years and I still had three years of basketball eligibility left in college. And I was like, man, I know some stuff mentally. I mean, I may not be the best basketball player, but I'm going, you know, I, I'm going to go walk on to UC Santa Cruz and just make the team. And that's what I did. And, you know, I just walked on and and made the basketball team. And I knew while I was playing hoops, I was like, man, I got something mentally. Like I, I'm not at all the best player on this team, but I have something that nobody else has. You know, and it wasn't until I finished college that I heard the word sports psychology that I started to piece together. Okay, I got some stuff, you know. But um, anyway, yeah, that's that's what I did at nineteen. I uh, and I had no one to talk to. I couldn't talk to any of my friends about it. They were thinking about other stuff, and here I was just working on healing. Mm-hmm. You know, doing that as a male. You know, so that and I'm just so thankful my mom had someone to go to, you know, and she just didn't tell me to like mask my feelings or suck it up or something like that, you know, and that's where I think that hippie background and that real, that real love and light background about healing and being whole uh, came into play, you know, big time. So I'm so thankful for that. I don't know any, I don't think I wouldn't have made it without that. You know? So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. 
But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. I couldn't help but notice that you specifically said uh, as a male. And I, I re- one, I appreciate that because I think you're right. I mean, in the culture that we live in, uh, you know, you're probably familiar with Brene Brown's work. She says males in yeah. particular uh, have a really hard time as not seeing vulnerability as a sign of weakness. Yeah, it's uh, I, I, can you mind if I jump in? Yeah, absolutely. Jump- By all means. The, uh, so this is what I got from all that work. I got supreme confidence, right? Not, not fake confidence, not confidence is here one day, then leaves. Yeah. Not confidence this baits on like existent, some like outside. I got internal confidence, which is unshakable, right? When you, when you really tap into your internal confidence, you're like, okay, I got it. You could pay me a million dollars or a dollar. I still have it. I got it. You know, so this idea, and I got all of this through being vulnerable. All of this was because I called my mom. I'm, I'm going to get super vulnerable and tell her I'm going to die and I'm depressed. And so from that letting go and being vulnerable, all this power came to me. I mean, like a lot of power came. And so this concept that victory goes to the vulnerable became very clear to me. That for you to become victorious in life, you have to be vulnerable. That that's actually where your greatest victories are. So again, I've always tried to frame this in a way that was very competitive so you could attract the competitive person because it's usually the competitive male that's the one that's not willing to be vulnerable and they're the ones who are not willing to like expand and I thought this arena needs this and it has to be phrased in a positive way because being vulnerable has often been phrased in a way that it hasn't given people a chance to do it where they feel empowered so I've tried to phrase it in a way that being vulnerable is actually what the most badass people do. You know, if you're a badass, you get vulnerable. You know what I mean? Like that's what you do. And so we, that whole idea is, is what I try to get across to males. And one of the things I think I've been able to be successful in the male basketball world is because I need no validation from the players. And a lot of them I found are impressed with that. Because a lot of people that are around the players need the player to tell them they're doing good or they actually need something from the player. I don't need anything from the basketball players. I already have the confidence. And in my opinion, I have the confidence they're looking for, that deep, deep confidence that will allow them to be vulnerable. Deep down, the best athletes in the world are the ones that just get the most vulnerable, period. That's what they do. And they actually know they're just not in danger. You know, so mental training is allowing yourself to be in that space, having the self-talk to talk you into it. You know, really having that faith to go into that vulnerable space. And the athletes that go into that vulnerable space, they win. They win more than anybody. So once you realize that's how you win, you stop avoiding being vulnerable and you go towards being vulnerable. Um, But, you know, there's a stigma behind it, right? Like being vulnerable, why would I want to be vulnerable? (laughs) That's, you know, that's for someone who's soft. But we actually know it's it's for the tough. You know, being vulnerable is, is, you know, what it's about. So I really appreciate that. And and so I, I spend a lot of my energy going towards males um, because I can I can reach a lot of them, you know, mm-hmm. and they need it. What do you think in our darkest hours, uh, certain people are able to navigate them somewhat gracefully and others um, let whatever is going on become very intertwined with their stories and their identity? Are you wondering like how some people are able to? Yeah, like what differentiates that those those two people? Uh, again, you know, I mean, this is this is uh, I'm asking this because yeah. I know in a moment when I was going through something incredibly difficult, I didn't handle it well, uh, right? And I got extremely caught up uh, in the idea that the world around me and, and the story of what was happening was my identity at a certain point. Like the two were completely inseparable, right? 
Right. You know, so I, I, to me, a really big difference of people that I see um, flowing through life, through all of life's challenges and, and obstacles, they, they tend to have a really deep understanding of who they are. And, but for example, what I mean by that, and so let's just use basketball for an example, right? We'll just, we'll just, we'll just use basketball. The really good players that play basketball know they're not a basketball player at all. That's simply what they do. It's not who they are whatsoever. So when something goes wrong in basketball, it, it really has nothing to do with their course identity. And so they're able to kind of move through the challenges and obstacles and stuff that comes up without sticking to anything, without holding on to anything. So if someone said, hey, you know, your basketball game sucks, you're terrible, you go, yeah, that's, that's true about the game. I'm not terrible. I'm great. But my basketball game did suck tonight. You are correct about that. That has nothing to do with who I am, though. And so the players who make that differentiation are not afraid to fail. And so they'll continue to do the right actions and be present and be in it, even though it feels really uncomfortable, even though technically everything is going wrong. But to them, it's just a challenge. And so they look at these things as opportunities to be challenged, not ways that show they're bad or they they don't look at it as, oh, this is going to show them a bad basketball player. This isn't anything like that. They look at it, hey, what a great challenge. What a great opportunity for me to trust my skills. What a great opportunity for me to be really vulnerable because that's what I'm looking for. I'm seeking vulnerability. And what a great opportunity for me to let go of of everything and keep flowing. So the players and people I've found that do that the most graceful – are the most unattached to stuff here. They are, they're in flow and they understand that, um, I don't know if you've ever read the book, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. You know, one of them is take nothing personal. Another one is assume nothing. They really do take nothing personal, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, they, and they just keep going. Because anything that comes up for you while I'm doing my thing, that's your stuff. That has nothing to do with me. You know, so um, it's, it's that differentiation. And the biggest thing I think that holds people back is they think they are what they're doing. Mm. And if you think you are what you're doing and shit's going bad, shit, all of a sudden you're like, uh, I must not be doing well in life. And yeah. that's not true at all. But if you're grounded, and I even go deeper and I lead them to this, that you're a spiritual being living the human experience, choosing to play a children's game. And if they can have that grounding, they really I'm a spiritual being living the human experience. And within the human experience, there's all kinds of feelings and emotions and all this stuff. But even that's not who I am. Even that's not who I am. Man, when you can get to that deeper, deeper level, and this is when you see really someone with a ton of faith, you'll see them with true faith when everything is going wrong and they're still okay because they are at that really deep level. You know, and to me, that's the supreme level of confidence where it's not seeing is believing, it's believing is seeing. Like, you don't need to see it to believe it, where most people need to see it to believe it. And I, at that very deep level, um, that you don't, you don't need to see it in the outside world, you already know it. And so you're living with, with that faith, you know. And so, kind of going back to your question, they've usually failed horrifically in life and realize they weren't going to die. So they don't go into situations going forward anymore where they're scared to die. Mm -hmm. Um, they've, you know, and if you haven't had that separation yet, then people are still operating out of fear, you know? And so the greatest athletes, they're not operating out of fear. They're free. Freedom to me is the highest level of confidence we're trying to go to where you are free to do what you do and be extremely vulnerable. And, but you have enough compassion and empathy in your heart that you're okay with that. And then, um, you're going you're gonna to go do what you do. So there's no real like simple answer to that. It's yeah. kind of all those things combined. But, you know, you just you open your heart up, throw yourself in it, and you don't attach to anything. Mm-hmm. And the more you realize none of this stuff, this isn't even you anyway. There's, there's something bigger than you operating. Then you kind of get out of your own way. I mean, we kind of look at we, – we study samurais a lot. You know, a samurai, these Japanese warriors, before they would go into battle, um, a lot of them, you know, they would do visualizations of dying. They would do visualizations of, of ending their lives. So that way, when they went into battle, they weren't afraid to die. They've already died. And so they're free to trust their sword. They're free to trust what they've been trained to do. And so for athletes, we want them in that space. We essentially want to kill your ego. And your ego is what gets caught up in a bunch of, bunch of stuff that's just 
not going to help you out. But if you can get out of the way of your own ego and you let your body do what it was trained to do, man, your body will do amazing things, you know? So, uh, I don't know if that makes any sense, but oh yeah, well, it's work. It's, it's work. It takes work. I think that makes uh, a really perfect setup to do what I want to do now, which is really do a deep dive into the how and the practical aspects of this. I mean, your stories have been amazing. And of course, you know, the question I think that comes up in my mind and probably anybody else is listening is, okay, great. This sounds awesome. I want to get to that level of being able to remo- remove my own layers to build what you call an unshakable confidence, um, and an unshakable level of mental toughness. So, um, one, I'd like you to talk about what you do specifically with athletes. And of course, then what can we take from all of this and start applying to our own lives today? Like after they, after we listen to this conversation. Yeah, no, really good stuff. So I kind of like, how do I do this work? I, I would say the most important thing for me for doing this work is I'm living this. I didn't just read books and I'm telling you some words I learned. Like I'm living this and I'm living it at the, at the cellular level, you know, being vulnerable and, and doing this type of stuff. So when I'm in the space of an athlete or someone, um, some of my greatest strengths is taking their guard down, you know, and so they're like they're open because to do this work, a lot of pe- people say, hey, you know, I, I want to experience that supreme confidence. And I'm like, do you know what it takes? Because what it takes is you have to you have to gut-wrenchingly look at all the stories you're telling yourself and you have to go through all the feelings that you're probably trying to avoid and we're going to go at those and we're going to open our heart up and we're going to be comfortable being uncomfortable and we're going to be extremely vulnerable and we're going to cry a lot and we're going to we're going to do all this stuff so then I asked him again I'm like what do you want to do this like do you really want to do this because there's a riddle that we always say with like you know psychologists or coaches and You know, like how many psychologists does it take to change a flat tire? And the answer is, I don't know. The flat tire has to want to change itself, you know? So this, this whole thing comes from everybody has it in them. And as soon as they want to do the work, then it starts. And what I, what I tell people is that let's first frame this in a context of expectations. There is no quick fix. There is no me and you are going to talk for 30 minutes and magically some, like something happens to you. You know what I mean? Like it's not going to, it doesn't work like that. Either you, you're going to do the work or you're not, you know, it's like talking about lifting weights. We can talk about lifting weights all day, but you actually have to go lift the weights at some point. You have to go like mess with gravity and resist and push. And so there is, it's getting that buy in at first that, Hey man, this is a journey. And this journey is going to be going through all the little things that are holding you back. And we're going to defeat them like warriors. And we're going to have a warrior mindset. And we're going to go to each story you have. And what I always call is we're going to poke holes in your stories. We're going to poke holes in, in a story that says it's impossible that I do this. And I'm going to say, okay, is that true? Right? And we're going to prod it. And we're going to look at it. And we're, and we're going to dig into it. So I say, look, if you want to do this work, give me three years. Give me three years. Because three years is what I found to be the kind of baseline for building a foundation of doing this work. And if someone wants a quick fix or someone wants to go take a pill, go do it. This, this isn't for you. This, what we're doing is, it's, it's like real work. I want you to retain this stuff, you know? So I, I try to frame it like that, you know, that if, cause I think most people, like we said in the West are looking for a quick fix. Mm-hmm. They're looking, I just want to do this as quick as I can with be, without really changing anything. I don't really want to do anything. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, then let me know when you're ready to do the work. You're not ready. You know what I mean? You have to come with an empty cup. You have to come with an open mind um, to do this stuff. You know, so what I found with basketball players was what I, when I set off on this mission is I need, to, I need to work with people that help people do this work. So if you go, oh, so-and-so is doing it, I may as well do it too. You know, there's no reason to fight it. And so that, that, that's always been my mission is to make this cool mm-hmm. and to kind of, kind of work with people that could, could help brand this as cool. You know, they can make this something that's popular because to actually do this work, but man, this is work. Like this isn't like, it's a, uh, I'm not going to talk to someone for 30 minutes and they listen and nothing happens. They have to actually go out and change their behavior mm-hmm. and behavior change is extremely uncomfortable, right? No. I mean, people would, would almost rather die than change their behavior. In fact, they do that all the time. You'll be like, Hey, what you're doing is going to kill you. That's ah, fine. It's comfortable. I'll just keep smoking cigarettes. No biggie. I'll deal with it later. Like they, they just don't, they don't want to deal with it. So 
I'm like, hey, I put it in a competitive context. I say, this is just like training your body. We got to get uncomfortable to, to gain strength. You know, that's how we do it. And we're going to do it a little bit every day for quite some time, you know, and that's, that's how this works. You know, so I, I tried to take, the, take away the mystery of it because sometimes with mental training, it's so vast and so big mm-hmm. that people, people don't, a lot of people have read a sports psychology book or a mental training book. They just don't know where to start. Yeah. They're just done reading. They're like, what the, like, it was so much. What do I do? So my goal was to make it simple. And I, I write plays. So the first three plays are what I teach people. And I'll just tell it to your audience right now. I found that these three plays uh, can change people's lives and help them immediately. And we found that wisdom is relaxing. So for example, play one is what we call win. And win stands for what's important now. And ultimately, we all want to win at something. But the irony is you have absolutely no control over results and outcomes. So play one is about figuring out what's in my control. Let me narrow my focus to what I actually control. And what you actually control, and we start on this level, is your attitude, your effort, and your focus right now. You have absolute control over those three things. And think about, you hear the word attitude all the time, or we're not trying to be corny, but think about how hard it is to have a positive attitude all the time. Or to have an open-minded attitude when you get uncomfortable. You know? Um, And the second one, effort. Like, how often are you actually putting in everything you have? to go for something. And then your focus. You, you may not be focused on the right thing, but you're always focused on something. And what we want to help you become aware of is to focus on what's happening right now in this moment, to be present. So we just start with those three things because that's what's in your control. And then the next play is what we call playing present, that whatever you're choosing to do in life, you could be running a podcast, you could be a violin player, you could be an engineer, you could be a teacher, whatever, firefighter, student, mother, it doesn't matter. You have to be present with what you're doing. You have to actually be there. And being present is really easy when it's pleasurable. Being present can get really hard when it's painful. So this idea of being present is simple for pleasure, and we want to help people learn how to be present when it's not so comfortable. Right? And so that's the second play. And then the third one is what we call next play speed. And next play speed is... How fast can you recognize you're not present and you get yourself back to the present? And you can actually track, if you're watching a basketball player on TV, what their next play speed is. You can see if a player is stuck and they're not moving forward. You can literally see it with their body. So we just start with those three things. What's in your control? Now you've got to be present with what you're doing. And when you're not present, you've got to get back to the present as fast as you can. Because if you're not here, where are you? And if you're not here, here is where all your power is. The only place you can be, you, the only time you can be alive is right now. So if your conscious and energy is not here, you are missing life. You're, you're not even alive fully. So we just start with those three things. That's a lifetime's work, just mastering those three things. You know, but that's when I coach and I work with an athlete, I never ask about statistics and results. I simply ask about those three things. How'd you do focusing on what you control? How'd you do being in the moment? How'd you do getting back to the moment when you lost it? That's it. And with next play speed, you can, like I said, you can track it. So I, I want to share a story of, you know, how I, someone I started doing this with when they were really young. Uh, if any of your listeners follow basketball, the, in, the, in the slam dunk contest that just happened in February in Toronto, there was two guys that competed in it. One guy was named Zach Levine and one guy is named Aaron Gordon. And both of them I've been training for years. Aaron, I've been training since he was 11 years old. And I started working with him when he was super young and he bought into this concept of next play speed. So by the time he was 14 or 15 years old, he would move forward in the game after airballing a shot, after getting his shot blocked, he would just keep moving forward. And by the time he got to college at the University of Arizona, he had been doing this for four or five years. And so when his coach at Arizona saw him play, his coach was like, oh my God, Aaron is born with this special motor. Somehow he just magically is always moving forward. He's always moving on to the next play. And what I thought to myself was, don't cheat him because he wasn't born with that. He trained that. And if you say he has a motor, what I would always ask him is, well, what runs your motor? And they would, you know, your mindset runs your motor. Well, there you go. So what Aaron really has is a trained mind that allows his body to constantly be moving forward. And as you pointed out before we started this, sometimes when things get tough, we get stuck. 
and we don't move forward. We, we kind of hold on and the feelings click in and, and there we go. And so he's trained himself to constantly move, to constantly move. So his next play speed is phenomenal. Like it's really, really good. So what I tell people is, man, it took him years to do that. He had an intention and an awareness to start and he had a will and energy to practice. Like anything else you do, you need a will and energy to practice these skills. And you need to work on them over and over and over again. And I always say, hey, man, you know, like I said, give me 700, 800, 900 days with someone and we can do something. We're not going to do something in, in seven minutes or seven hours. You know, so Aaron's one of those guys who's been doing this since he was young. And, you, you know, he's 20 years old. He's in the NBA. He just finished his second year in the NBA. And he is at a point where... He's starting to like almost like that was the age where I started training. Aaron's already been doing this for seven or eight years. So my goal was to give him what I learned at 19 as young as I could. And so here he is doing it and he is way, way deep with how much he knows. And I just, we kind of use his free throw shooting as an example. When he was shooting free throws in high school and college, he was shooting 35, 40% and people thought he was a terrible shooter. But his mindset was, no, I'm, I'm just going to keep getting better at this. I'm going to keep getting vulnerable. I'm going to keep missing free throws and feeling vulnerable because eventually I'm going to figure it out. And now as a pro, I think this year he might have shot like 69 or 70 percent. So he's jumped up like 25, 30, 35 percent since high school and college just from allowing himself to be vulnerable. So we have this kind of person here in Aaron Gordon who will literally jump over a mascot can it was maybe the greatest dunk contest of all time and he's also saying that hey the way you get victory is by being really vulnerable you know and he knows that so i think we're at this place in time where like this is going to happen like we are going to allow people to understand how you win through being vulnerable you know and how this training works because um i I just it just feels like it's time you know when people are searching for that yeah yep one thing that you said earlier um, was at the start of this work, one of the things you start to do is poke holes in the stories that people tell themselves. And I am really curious what common stories that you have seen in the work that you've done among people uh, that you've had to poke holes in. And how do we poke holes in our own stories um, and start to alter them? Well, I think, uh, you know, it start, I, I actively tell people around me, if you see something I can't see, help me see it. So I want people around me to, to help me see if I'm operating under a story that's outdated or has no place, I, I actively invite people to, to help me with that. So you got to be open, right? Because you're, you're asking for feedback. You're asking for someone to say, hey, man, do you know that you're really limited with how you think right there? And you're the only one who thinks like that. And none of us think like that about you. And so um, that's a start is being open. The, the story that I, that I think that me that – I give most people the relief in is that they're not what they do, that that's the first story, you know? So like a, like a student who's like, I am my grade. You know, if, if I get an A, then I'm good in life. But if I don't get an A, then, then I'm terrible and I'm going to fail and I'm going to be like homeless. You know, the story runs like really, really deep and they, they never consciously look at it, but they're thinking to themselves, if I don't get an A on this test, my parents aren't going to love me and I'm going to be homeless. And so I, I help them understand you are not the result of what you do. And I just poke holes in that story relentlessly, like relentlessly with no mercy because people need it because they aren't what they do. I'm, I've done a million things in my life. When I was four years old, what I was doing was different than when I was 12. And when I was 12, it was different than 19. So we're always going to do different things, but you're always who you are. That never changes. So if you can poke holes in that story, I found that that helps people with depression I found that that helps people with not being as sick and ill all the time because they're more whole. They're, they feel more complete. So that's kind of the start, you know, is just poking a hole in that. And then we poke holes in what you control because so many people think they control results and outcomes and they judge themselves on results and outcomes. And I just, I try to poke holes in those stories all the time. Like you can't control results and outcomes at all. And I think a lot of people actually think they can control a result. <laughs> like they genuinely go through life thinking like, like I can control this yeah. and you can't, there's nothing you can do in it. And so relaxing when you stop trying to control things you can't control. So we, the first story is I'm going to poke holes in what you control and I'm going to help relax you because once you start judging yourself on what you control, man, life gets way better. Hey, what was my attitude? Like, let's go back to your story right earlier. you like, you went through a hard time and you just didn't do it very well. I'd say, okay, if we had to do it again, 
Yeah. What would you want your attitude to be like? Right. What would you want your focus to be like? What would you want your effort to be like? Remember, I didn't ask how you're going to feel. How you're going to feel is how you're going to feel. We're, we're not going to change how you feel in different situations, but how you look at those feelings, we can absolutely change. Your perspective on those feelings, we can absolutely change. Mm-hmm. For example, what you, what you call pressure, I might call joy. And it's the exact same feeling. What you call fear, I, I call opportunity. Same feeling. I just approach it way differently. You know, so I, that's kind of the initial stuff I poke holes in is what's in your control and who you are. Mm-hmm. And we go from there, you know, and we just kind of, cause right away they're like, oh, wow. You know, and then in a, a big one for me, is you see a lot of athletes, they talk about faith all the time. So a big, a big thing I work on with people is true faith, like really, really faith, you know? And so someone will talk about a situation they're in and I'll say, what would that situation look like if you had absolutely no worry about the result and you had absolute faith, what would it look like? And when you, and as soon as you ask that person, someone a question, you just see this sense of relief in their eyes. They're like, Oh, who cares about the result? Well, I would do this and I would do this without worrying. And I'm like, then that's what you do. And then right away, they're like, ah, but the result. And I'm like, but hey, we got to poke a hole in that story that you control results. Like, we we got to poke a hole in that. Mm. You know, and then, and then so that's kind of the balance. And they're like, yeah, but I'm a little uncomfortable. And I say, well, let's, let's go into that uncomfortable space because that's where your victory is, right? That's, that's where it is. So it's almost like I corner people into not limiting themselves. I'm pretty good with language so I can help people understand that how to not get in their own way which is really all I do is help people get out of their own way so they get to their source, so they get to their power. And the only thing that's in their way is limiting stories and beliefs that are built up over time and are attached to emotions and feelings. And if we can just start working through some of those, you'll realize nothing's holding you back. You know? So I don't know if that makes sense. But. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, well, I'd like for you to tell people a little bit about Lucid, and then we will wrap things up because, uh, you know, I, I want to definitely give you an opportunity to, to talk about the company that you're building. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, Lucid. So Lucid, uh, mental training for athletes. We are a tech company in San Francisco, and we're building an app to deliver mental training to the world. And our, our philosophy is everyone deserves this. We believe everyone deserves mental training. We believe this isn't for the privileged or the lucky, that everyone can access this. And we just want to find a way to deliver it to kids in China, kids in Nebraska, kids in New York, adults, doesn't matter. Um, and that's what we're here to do. And so, so far we have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on the app. We have George Mumford who's on the app. If you guys have read the book, The Mindful Athlete, George has also trained Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant. He's who trained Phil Jackson. He's a legendary person in mental training. So we're building a team here of people who can deliver all this good wisdom and information to you in basically five to 10 minute mental workouts every day. And the workout we came up with is, you know, I came up with a term called an MVP. And an MVP doesn't stand for most valuable player. It stands for meditation, visualization, and positive affirmations. So we create these little workouts for you every day that all you got to do is you download the app, you hit play on your phone, put your headphones in, and you're training with us. And you don't have to wonder what to do. You just follow along and and we'll guide you. And our goal is we're going to guide you to your real strength. And we're going to guide you to your source inside and help you use that source in a responsible way. And so you can be on your purpose in this life, you know, really satisfying yourself from within where your validation comes from within, you know, and that's, that's our purpose. And it took me 12 years to write my book, play present. Um, it was under 50 pages. And the reason it, it took so long is because I needed to make it simple. I needed to make this where someone was done reading it and they go, I know exactly how to start training. And so what Lucid did is they took play present and they just, they acquired us. And so now I'm kind of the voice for play present on the app right now. Um, it's my voice you'll hear. And we're slowly integrating um, other great coaches as well. So for me, this I'm I've been living what I've been kind of preaching the whole time. You know, I, I built this program without knowing where it, where or how it was going to work, but somehow I knew it needed to be built. I just knew, and it was crystal clear how to do it. And so for me, we you know we met up with these great tech people here, and here we are. We formed Lucid, and you know our goal literally is to help the world and, and deliver mental training to everybody. 
Well, um, I will be downloading the app immediately after your conversation, <laughs> and I will, I will definitely link it up in the show notes and mention it on the newsletter for people who haven't uh, subscribed yet. Uh, so, Grant, this has been phenomenal. Uh, I have one last question for you, which is how yeah. we finish all our interviews at The Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? <sighs> to me... To me, it's about being the most authentic you you can be, like really having that courage to be who you are, not what society says you're supposed to be or what anyone else says you're supposed to be. It's really being who you are because when you really are who you are in this world, you show everyone else how to be who they are. And I, you can call it like illuminating or you know, shining your light, but man, that, that's it to me. And that's how I can tell someone, you know, when, when you do, you can just feel their light when they're around them, you know? Well, uh, this has been phenomenal. It really has. This has probably been one of my favorite conversations I've had in the last two months. Um, it awesome. just, you've blown my mind with so many wonderful <laughs> insights and, uh, you know, I, I really, really, really appreciate you taking the time to join us and share your insights and your stories. I think you're going to be a really big hit with our listeners. Hey, my pleasure and love to come back. If you ever want me, I, I love spreading this word and this is what I'm here to do. Awesome. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person, because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.